Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Brave New World, with the Code Doctor update for, of course, the mod itself. Uh, I've said that several times, and every single episode, I'm thinking it's the last one. But, you know, at this point, I've been wrong so many times, I'm not going to say this is the last one. It is what it is, but if you want to rebuild the, or read about rebuilding the whole army, please go right ahead, and then the Krakow Uprising, we'll see what we can do. People of the city of Krakow, people of Poland, what the heck is this? Uh, the home army still stands strong. The Wehrmacht is distracted. The Germans are weak. Your chance for liberation from those national daddyists tyranny is as the last arrived. Pick up your arms, rally your fellow brothers in arms, and prepare for the, for the fight of your lives. Krakow rides. Who is the mental mage? Racial favoritism. <clears throat> Former governor of Georgia. Wait. What? Is that another president that I don't know about yet? Herman. The South's most faithful son. Ooh. I don't think he's... He does not have content. He does not have content. Okay, I got I got really excited. Uh, darn it. Hey, 49% growth is not bad. Yearly deficit still is in the green. Attempt tax hike would help uh, take care of that. But um, we're still trying to integrate a lot of places. Of course, um, the port of the Germans of Gotland. Uh, we'll see you until the very end. If we don't do that, then we might still have them, so... Um, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, because we're still going to make more collaborations governments if we can. I do know that we annexed, you know, Belarus, the Baltic States. It was in the past, so how much we can really do about it, which sucks, because the mod isn't 100% perfect, but it's not bad. And I do thoroughly enjoy this mod a lot. I love, like, what the dead are done. Same, Sankt Petersburg, yes. Hurts our stability a little bit, but, you know, whatever. Hey, not bad, not bad. Um, 1.27 is actually pretty decent though. That's pretty good to get. Um, debt to GDP ratio is doing okay. 9% growth, finally. After that negative, uh, all that integrating, yeah, that's much better. Much better to deal with. 84% with that debt interest going up barely. I'm feeling a little better about this now. But, Poland's a little green men is the next one we're going to read. And we're actually already at another well oiled machine. Can you go any higher? Darn it, we can't. Oh, wait, what? Oh, there we go. Can we not? Liberate Poland? Bruh. Bruh. Uh, Kowalski proudly served in the one of the Polish regiments during the Second West Russian War. He didn't care about the values the Federation brought to his hometown in Nova Polska, just that they would fight against the Germans. Kowalski remembered being in cities like Volgo, Gorad, Rostov, Kharkiv, Kiev, and the ending the war near Brest. Despite the many victories, Poland sitting right across the new border would never sit straight with him. He remained within the Polish units after the war, but his spirit had left and his passion during the war and prior had collapsed or disappeared. When a batch of borders acquired his unit to move to western Ukraine, he didn't think much about it. Only when it's superior to that he could no longer write letters or make calls to, about their current location did Kowalski start to question what was going on. When they were out of the military installation near the Polish border, he was surprised by the raw number of people in rather plain clothing. Officially, they were Polish refugees attempting to flee the violence of the war, and they are now stuck within the Federation, officially. They are the first batch of proud Poles who were to be trained and equipped to jumpstart the Second Polish Uprising. They were to be equipped and trained, and when the time was right, they would seek, sneak across the border and cause the chaos necessary for the Nova Polska units to cross the border and volunteer against the German threat. <clears throat> Kowalski couldn't believe it. Before, it seemed like the Russians only kept the Poles around because they needed everyone against a German threat, but this was different. Poland was to be liberated once more to the breach. Bruh. Uh, honestly, we're going to do all these like normal, read through all these as much as we can, and then use the comms commands to get through all this stuff to see if there's actually anything different. But, remnants of Armenia. Once part of the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union, Armenia has endured this uh, reign of terror, spearheaded by the Grey Wolves of Turkey. Massacres have become commonplace in Armenia as the national daddies of Turkey have consistently tried and failed to exterminate the resilient peoples of Armenia. Although the Turks have failed in the past, if nothing is done to save the Armenian people from the Turkish oppression, the Grey Wolves may one day successfully exterminate the peoples of Armenia, and with it, the idea of the Armenian state will exist only in the pages of history. It's unacceptable. The Federation cannot stand by and watch what was done or people has done in Armenia. We must do what we can to liberate the Armenians from Turkic oppression and ensure that the ancient identity and culture of Armenia survives. And we'll read about forgive me no longer. Sin in Russia's mon monster. <clears throat> uh, Dmitry Ivan of, uh, uh, is a man who's willing to do whatever needs to be done in order to achieve victory in the name of Russia with assistance from the off-books team created by the president to combat foreign threats and to fight for Russian interests. We can cause havoc to the Turkic army. Uh, <clears throat> Gain insight on their every move and break them from within. Sin in the monster. <coughs> Forget me no longer. The Maos are rested softly in the crook of David's shoulder with its stock nestled into the dark dirt of Dilijan. The night sky above cloaked the landscape in darkness and the fire cracked softly, crackled softly, its tempo erratic. In his hands, a relic of the past. It was another night, of course. For David, if that was something to find pride in, now. His hands, calloused and scarred, gripped firmly along the edge of the photos. Uh, its dusty black and white coloration was illuminated by the flickering flame in front of him, with the smudged little figures only slightly visible. His eyes quietly 
uh, drifted along the front, uh, looking eyes upon looking upon those greeny little figures. He'd seen this sight perhaps a thousand times over. Now, had sat aside his campfire and over and over again after days worth of fighting, his slum uh, running softly along the side of the photo ever slightly ruffled his dirty white edges. He could still remember their voices occasionally, could remember their smiles, their laughter, even in the faces of the circumstances before. Their youth, that was which was stolen from them. Perhaps back then they'd have been here only sitting, sitting by side. Perhaps he wouldn't have had to be the only one left. Perhaps there could have been some hope for the future of the people. They call themselves Fidali for a reason. Those who sacrifice, and that was not the case for him. Anush Tigran Arax Algan now. He fought so long now, since he was a young boy, he fought for Armenia, yet he had died. He would have yet to die for Armenia. He had lost his friends and his family. He had lost what made it anything to him. His teeth under the scraggly beard that adorned his face was tightly grit. Um, the feelings within him he could not describe a concoction of rage and hurt. Was this his fate to fight forever for the sake of a people that he could no longer feel the joys of? He would either die or be alone, neither meet his end uh, or by some means kill, kill, and kill uh, until he finally stood alone atop a mountain of corpses which nobody else uh, finally appreciated the view. What could be one here? Was it, would it be even worth it? David's face, pampered with dust and soot, had been disturbed by the sullen flow of red hot tears. There was no means of controlling it anymore, nothing to hold him back. He missed him, he missed his family, he darned every god possible and darned the Turk. None of it would soothe his pain and none of it would end the cycle. Under that night sky, the son of Armenia sobbed, knowing that he could not appreciate the fruits of his own struggle from the rebels. Much like the partisans of the Croatia. Uh, the Armenian rebels have survived in the mountains, but their strength and numbers are faltering as the Armenian people began to lose faith in resistance. Luckily for the rebels, though. <clears throat> They have the vast resources of the Russian Federation now available to them. Uh, the, with Armenians fully equipped with the best equipment we can offer, they get in the tide and beat back the Turkish forces, bringing new hope for the noble cause of our Armenian liberation from, from Turkic tyranny. <coughs> Can't wait to get some comments in the... the uh, oh, Jane Personnel. That did nothing. Uh, can't wait for comments from Turks. Yeah. And we're finally done with our land auction. How's it coming doing? What are we building? Not much here, huh? Send in Russia's monster, yes, please. The vulture of the mountains. The two guards posted at the entry points, all carrying fully automatic rifles. A central command center is located near the main road. Uh, judging from the high security officers present inside, there are two APCs in the parking bay. Uh, be mindful of those who are entering. There's a bunker door heavily guarded. That has to be where the rebels are being held. Dmitri lowered his binoculars, jotting down the observable details on his notepad before rubbing his eyes and wiping the sweat from his brow. He wasn't used to the heat here, but he'll manage. The agent sat back against the rocks that lie just beyond the perch, steadying himself in for the long wait. The Great Wolves had taken some Armenian rebels prisoner after ambushing their base of operations. The target of interest was Gurgen Dalebaltajan. He had to sneak into the compound and get the rebels, Gurgen especially, out without being seen by the Turkish troops. Seems simple enough, but unlike the werewolves, the Great Wolves were well armed and well coordinated. Unlike at home, Russia's monster didn't have the resources of Russia at his disposal. He'll have to be careful if he was to succeed in rebuilding the leadership of the Armenian resistance. Dimitri sighed. At least he wouldn't be alone on this mission. The rebels had given him a guide to accompany him on the mission. Amen. He was enthusiastic to leave the bases. He was a type who liked to explore, according to other rebels. Staying put didn't do him well. He would be he would double as a translator since Dmitri didn't know a lick of Armenian, and he's one of the what and it is he is the one expected to free Armenia's best general. Uh, having a translator make work here in Armenia much smoother. Speaking of Armen, Dmitri began to wonder just where his guide guide ran off to. Just another day at work. And the Armenian Revolution. The rebels have gained strength in recent weeks, as the Great Walls continue to weaken as a result of Dmitri Ivanov's efforts behind the front lines. With Turkey more isolated than ever before, the Armenian leadership have approached their government requesting the Federation support giving them a full democratic revolution against the Turkish government and help them achieve independence from their oppressors. For the Reichstone shambles, now would be the best time to strike what remains of the Turkish Empire. Let the revolution begin. Even though we got quite a few days left here as well. Um, yeah, we'll definitely go read all these stuff. Um, I'll we'll probably do Belarus first, maybe? Belarus was the first nation to have German boots on their soil, with Minsk being the first city of the former Soviet Union to fall. They lost lands to the German Reich with the city of Brest, being fully colonized by German settlers. The natives of Belarus were heavily oppressed, with millions being executed throughout General Plan Ost. Although the plan failed, Belarusians saw to suffer the loss of the rights of the people and endure segregation in their own country. The Austin Civil War and the Second West Russian War only made the conditions of Belarus even worse, as conflict over the land became fierce with civilians being caught in the crossfire. Things have changed for Belarus, changed for the better. The Russian Federation triumphant over the Reich has come to set things right for Belarus. Nor will the people have to fear the Gestapo, nor will they be seen as subhuman. The winds of change have arrived and they have come to bless Belarus. In the Hall of the Mountain King, uh, Ali was escorted into the rebel headquarters located deep within the Armenian mountains, beyond the reach of the Turks. He was flanked by two guards, each armed with AKMs, courtesy of the Federation at the center of the room. Looking down at a large map of Armenia marked with various crosses and circles, it was ahead of the Armenian resistance, Gurgen Zanakjan. Ali cleared his throat, getting the Armenians' attention. Gurgen looked away from the map, starred, staring the man in the eye for the moment. 
Hello, I'm Gurgen Zanik Zhan. I'm the de facto head of the resistance. I presume you're with the Russian intelligence. The Armenian ass as he shook Ali's hand. Ali Gazimov. I'm with the Sluzba Bezovaznosti, Ali replied, looking him in the eye. And Azerbaijani, I must confess, I didn't expect the Russians to send, well, your people to deal with us. Gurgen stated as he looked, uh, took a seat and sat down at the table. The tension in the room was palpable. Despite their isolation, the storm of rivalry that has endured for centuries was seemingly ready to roar at any second. Ali sighed, looking over to the flag of Armenia that hung proudly on the wall. Truthfully, Gurgen, I didn't want to be here. Um, Ali began, when they asked me to come here and negotiate the alliance between Armenia and the Federation, I wanted to say no, but Ali paused for a moment. He wondered what his answers would think of him. None of that mattered right now. There was bigger things than that. Regardless of what he thought about Armenia, one was single certain. He did not deserve to be massacred and burned to ash by the Turkish and the insanity that is the Great Wolves. He may be a son of Azerbaijan, but he refused to stand by and allow his injustice against the Armenians to continue any longer. There are bigger things than the rivalry between our two peoples. We both endured the evils of imperialism. Azerbaijan, thankfully, has been liberated from those who would, I, would have sought to annihilate our nation, just as the Turkish wish to do to you. And we wanted people to survive these difficult times. We had to put aside our differences and work together, Ali explained, turning away from the flag and looking back at the man in the chair. The room was quiet for a moment before Gurgen began to slowly nod. You're right, there are bigger matters than rivalry between our peoples. I'm willing to set it aside for the sake of freedom. I believe we have business to discuss. Please take a seat, Gurgen said with a smile, gesturing at the available chair. Ali smiled in return as he took his seat prepared to get to business. Setting aside the past for a brighter future. Only until you know. <coughs> and I'll answer the clique. For decades, the land of China remained broken under much of the eastern China, with much of eastern China under the subjugation of Japan. The situation in western China isn't much better. Although it's mostly free from the influence of Japan, the governments of the region are largely made up of despotic warlords, with the notable exception of Maklik. Maklik is only the remnants of the KMT, the Kuomintang, the party that once ruled the Republic of China prior to the Japanese invasion. Although they have continued to persist in China over the many years since their downfall. Oh, oh, oh. oh wow. What? Did they auto win? Um, the continued percent in China over the many years since their downfall, the power powers uh, uh, greatly diminished in the current state, seeming doomed, seem doomed to remain a warlord state uh, struggling to survive. The KMT may not be able to retake all of China in the near future, but with the help of the Russian Federation, we can help them invade their despotic neighbors, consolidate their power over Western China, stand as a beacon of hope and liberty in the remnants of the subjugated China. What the heck just happened here? How did you, like, auto-win? Bruh. Karen. Oh, you're a, com you're a commenter member. The oil crisis, oh god. And they have a looming fiscal crisis. Remember the Caucasian Liberation Front. Oh. Well, all I have to do down in Europe. We've got to do all these focuses first, so, uh. Rebuilding Ukraine. Ukraine, otherwise known as the breadbasket of Europe, lies in complete ruin with much of its infrastructure destroyed or distorted and its fields burned. Under the control of the Dmitry Duglinko, Ukraine has been relatively stable, but without assistance from the Russian Federation or reconstruction in the region is slow. Millions of people across Europe rely on Ukrainian harvest in order to feed their families. It's essential we rebuild Ukraine and reconstruct its agricultural industry as soon as possible, at least we risk a food crisis breaking out across uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, are they supposed to win? Batum? Corporatism. Uh, rebelled Ukrainian rose during advance towards Kiev. Much of the infrastructure of Ukraine had been completely annihilated by both the advancing all Russian army and the German saboteurs. Natural transport is a nightmare. Makes administering such a disconnected territory rather frustrating for Dmitry Glink and efficient. And uh, he has requested that the Federation assist in rebuilding the key highways and railway systems in Ukraine so both the reconstruction and administration can become much more efficient. Um. Okay. Sure. Hey, half a billion. Heck yeah. Uh, brother in reconstruction, we have come to Ukraine after Russify the region like the Russian governments before us who have tried several times and failed each time and every time. No, we came to Ukraine to liberate our Slavic brothers and sisters and ultimately re redefine our relationship with Ukraine. We're not a new colonial master, but friends of the peoples of Ukraine. We do not expect to win over the hearts and minds of every Ukrainian through mere words, the actions speak louder than words, and help them rebuild their cities and townships is a great place to start. With the Russians and Ukrainians working side by side to rebuild the land of Ukraine, new bonds of brother can be established between our two peoples. A bond not easily broken. Hopefully. Oh, hello. Okay, so we're over here. Following the collapse of the old Union, Turkey's gone down a dark path, spreading themselves out across the Middle East like their Ottoman ancestors, occupying and striking down minority groups throughout their policy of Turkification, all under the guise of promoting a unified and homogeneous Turkish state. Their participation in the Second World War led to the collapse of the Caucasian Front and allowed the Germans to seize the vast oil fields of Azerbaijan, condemning the peoples of the Soviet Union to decades of suffering and tyranny. The world may have forgotten about Turkey's actions, but Russia, of course, has not. The mountains of, Cauc of the Caucasus are alight once more as the people of the Caucasus are united, 
fighting for the right to be free Turkish rule, will help the Caucasian people defeat our mutual Turkish foe and at last get revenge against another nation that's caused much suffering to the people. Can we actually send divisions? Need oh crap! Involve ourselves in legionary Georgia's proxy war. Well, you know what? I'm going to go back and maybe fix this just a little bit. Um, and I might actually do some of this reading here as well. So we'll see. Uh, let's go ahead and finish and talk about Adan Kharsan. Star Wars released in theaters. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's Luke Starkiller. Oh, yeah. Adan Kharsan. Gregory sat on the stalk like Pierre, the warm water of the Black Sea flowing around his aching feet. The air smelled of salt with an undertone of rotting fish. It was warm that day, but not overly so, comfortable and not scorching. He held a camera in his lap, black, purchased from a shop in Tambov a few weeks ago. Originally, he'd want to bring his father's camera, but it had been broken during a German bombardment. This would have to do. He remembered running on those beaches years ago. Was it a sister, or was it only a memory of remembering? Sometimes, the images he conjured of those days seemed more like a flickering shadow, a mimic, neither the thing itself. So he could remember scraps. The taste of salt water, her hair flowing as she ran down the beach, the pain of a torn toenail. Ah, better days. The balding man opened his photo book. It was cracked, the spine nearly shattered from the cont continual use. Gregory flipped through the fingerprint stained pages first. The refugee can't be hidden in when the German sees Ukraine. Babushka's creased with age and dust, now long dead, stared back with terrified expressions. Then a mosque in Kazan and the Nationals ra rally roaring outside of it. He'd captured the rage so well, burning trash cans and a raised fist confronted the viewer, practically ready to strike them down on the spot. He flipped past several pages. Those was the unit he stayed with, smiling, a muscular private holding another in the headlock. Next to the photo was his boss of the propaganda ministry, cigar dangling from his mouth, his spectacles at the end of his nose as he frowned at the camera, and next to that an image of Nikol, uh, Nikopol, a battered men and women cheering as a mixed Ukrainian and Russian unit pulled the swastika down from the flagpole of the center, town center. <clears throat> As someone starting to set, Gregory lurched to his feet, sighting the, sighted the orange to the sky and the captured the moment for eternity, if she only was here to see it with him. We all remember you, Sasha. So we did talk about this one, but what about this one? The heart of Belarus. Minsk is to Belarus what Moscow is to Russia. The city of Minsk is the heart of the Belarusian nation, where it is able to exert its cultural, political, and economic strength. The city has of late is in ruins, even before the Austrian Civil War. The city became a broken skeleton of what it once was. The newest and best neighborhoods of Minsk were reserved for the German settlers who seemed to be arriving in endless amounts of all the while. The native Belarusians were rele relegated to ghettos, which were strife with crime and sickness. This cannot stand. With the proper time and capital invested into the reconstruction of Minsk, we can turn this from a depressing city of contrast into a shiny new hope for the people of not only Belarus, but for all of Eastern Europe, in which we're going to go ahead and use cons commands and get all of these stuff done. Honestly, we're going to use cons commands to get through all this stuff quickly, so at least we can get through this stuff and hopefully uh, get through all this stuff so we can continue going on. And, well, maybe we can actually send divisions and me not to get, delete the entire army. So now, everyone, we've gone back in the past a little bit. And now we're going to go ahead and do... Uh, both rebuilding the Baltic states, at least to get them done and read the events, and then, because the game is still going to annex them, it's February right now, but we're just, we already have cons commands, focus autocomplete on right now, the heart of Belarus. Um, so if you want to read this one again, please go right ahead, so we'll get that one done. And then we'll rebuild the schools. Ever since the Great Patriotic War, the people of Belarus have become increasingly illiterate, as a result of the schools being bombed and a large portion of the population being made into slaves of the Reich. Our ex commissar also ensured that the schools that did exist were reserved only for the children of the German settlers to ensure that the future of Belarusians would become too uneducated and disconnected from their culture to dare rise up and fight for their free Belarus. Also, they need another zero there, or another O, my bad. The children of Belarus deserve a proper education. <clears throat> It's time to open the schools up to all children in Belarus and to build new schools for heirs in dire need of them. One day, Belarus will become not only the land of eager learners, but also a proud nation of teachers. A religious rebirth. When the artificial state of Austin ruled over the peoples of Belarus, the state enforced a policy of atheism which had nearly crushed orthodoxy in Belarus. But with Belarus liberated from the rule of the Reich, the remnants of orthodoxy have made a major return in Belarus. The churches and cathedrals are being rebuilt across the land as a broken people find comfort and hope in the Lord. <clears throat> Why is the L and Lord not capitalized? We may be a secular state, but with a religious rebirth happening right before our very eyes, we should do what the Germans refuse to do. Respect and support the beliefs of Belarusians. Uh, Belarusian industrialism. The Belarusian people have always been a hardy and industrious people, but that is meaningless without any jobs to support these resilient peoples. It's true that many Belarusian businesses were crushed in the Austin Civil War, and haven't been able to fully recover since, and so poverty and homelessness have been on the rise. The Federation could change that. With proper industrial and economic assistance, the people of Belarus can finally return to work and lift themselves out of the state and forced poverty that had been subjected to under the Reich Commissariat Austin. Dreams of dream Freedom even before the long years of oppression and toil under the Reich, the people have yearned for freedom, and after all these years of pain and suffering under the Reich's commissariat hostile and hope has finally come. The people of Belarus deserve to be free in their own country, not to be in fear of being enslaved for expressing themselves or being torn away from their families, ever since Vasily Shukshin was inaugurated as the president of the Federation. 
He promised freedom above all else, and to do that, he shall deliver. The people of Belarus deserve better than the Reich, better than the Soviets, better than the Tsars. Eastern Europe deserves better. The White Russian Railway. <coughs> The military governor of Belarus, Boris Fulk, has approached the president with a new proposal to help Belarus's economy recover and lead the troubled nation out of poverty. I believe that they'll be reconstructing and expanding upon the railway system of Belarus, connecting in all major settlements of the nation into one efficient railway network. The cities would be able to better coordinate their reconstruction efforts and make moving around essential resources much easier to accomplish without risking any accidents. The president, who wants the reconstruction of Eastern Europe to be as fast and efficient as possible, and create long-term prosperity for the recently liberated lands and is in favor of this proposal is practically to demand we funnel what are the Federation can inspire into a rebuild on the White Russian Railway. And the future Belarus. It's been a long and difficult road for Belarus, but after years of suffering, the peoples of Belarus have finally found freedom. With that comes a question of their place in the Federation moving forward. Should we allow for independent Belarus to exist and have a strong and reliable ally to our West, or would it be better to integrate the lands of Belarus directly into the Russian Federation? The government has become divided over this issue, which has put in, pushed the question to President Shushin's desk in Moscow for him to answer. What will the future of Belarus be? The reconstruction of Belarus is finished at last, and with it comes a decision what the future of Belarus will be. What could easily integrate the Belarusian nation back into Russia? There are those who argue for the independence of Belarus, stating that managing the land directly would be too costly for the Federation, and having an ally to the Federation's interest in Europe much better. After much discussion in the highest level of government, decisions finally made. I would love to integrate them. I wanted to integrate them so badly, it's not funny. But give it a day, or a couple days, and then, eh, Belarus is okay. And we have all these other things to read too. Ah, Adversus Heresis. Father Mikhailaj fell knelt in the snow, <clears throat> and uh, praying in the ashes of a burnt cathedral. Our father, who ought to have him, hallowed be thy name, he muttered, droning the prayer from memory of thy kingdom. Crap! He buried his bald head in the snow. I don't understand, father. We survived all this. And you, let the, and you let the Nazis burn a village down as they retreat from Belarus? Why, 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 why won't you protect your flock, he said. The wind blew icy cold as Mikhailaj sat in silence. Minutes passed, and tens of minutes, maybe he would freeze to death in the waste of his home. But a glint of light caught Mikhailaj's eye. He crawled through the snow, transfixed until his hand struck something hard. He dug into the powdery flakes, uncovering a panel of scarlet glass. He scraped away the frost, covering what was once a stained glass window. First, he revealed that Theotokos, then the naked Christ child, nestled in his mother's loving arms, just as we are nestled in God's love every day, as old father Zimnasir had told him. But as the snow fell, the dark edge of a blade revealed itself behind the uh, Theotokos' back. No, not a knife, the crude ink black, blood soaked edge of the swastika. It loomed the virgin and her son emanating behind him like the impure light of Satan himself. But, Father, I I had to. They would have. Mela, Michelaj whispered, Oh, God, he was wrong. Oh, Christ, forgive me, forgive me, Father, forgive me, he whispered. I was wrong, forgive me. He rushed himself to his feet and looked out on the horizon. In the distance, he could barely see the buzzing lights of Germania. He folded his hands, God, protect the people of Belarus, and bring us back to your light, he began. Protect your eldest sons the children of Israel, save them from the temptation and suffering, he drew in his breath. Do you need to pray for them? <clears throat> and God, he mumbled, hesitating, Blessed people of Germany, I pray for their conversion and that you have, will have mercy on their souls. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Minsk reimagined. A crowd gathered around a set of concrete bunkers right in the middle of Minsk. The people were finally able to look at the German bunkers without, bunkers without fear of being shot, and it seemed only natural to examine the battle that was now thankfully in the past. After being clear for any firearms and explosives by the Russian soldiers, people were now permitted to look inside. While quite a few residents wanted the bunker gone, it wasn't a priority for the engineers and construction workers, who were stretched thin by the long list of jobs they had to attend to, meaning the bunkers would have to remain a little while longer. That's when a duo of young men stepped forward, each carrying heavy boxes in with them right outside the bunker. They pulled the odd top top odd, and inside it was a large bucket of paint and several brushes. One of the two, a young man with a mustache, began painting doves on the side of the bunker, the other painted a lazavi uh, sitting atop a log. One by one, the others started to join in, impaling uh, planes, flags of the Federation, boats, and forts across the enormous canvas that sat in the center of Insk. By the time the engineers were scheduled for the destruction of the bunker to become a massive art project that took thousands part in then. The thousands took part in. The artists discouraged. The destruction of what was now a monument to Belarusian history. The engineers left with other locations in mind, and so the bunker transformed from a symbol of German dominance to the endurance and strength of Belarusian culture. Rebellus, uh, Belarus reborn and hammered the nails. Read it again, Daddy, read it again, little Anton cried. His deep brown eyes gazed up at his father expectantly. His short cut bangs fell across his forehead like feathers on an angel's wings. Well, it is your bedtime, Maxim. Maxim said with a smile, God, his back ached. But just because I love you so much, we'll read it one more time. Then straight to bed. To be frank, he was sick of talking about trains at work. He was, he was laying track in endless arguments about timetables at home. He was worried about moving down the line and what they do when the connection between Smolensk and Minsk was finished. Anton smiled, melting Maxim's heart in an instant. Okay, just one more, the little boy said, but this one Maxim thought was worth it. Maxim lifted the bright blue child children's book and flipped to the cover. Above a midnight blue, coal-powered train racing down the freshly laid track, golden Cyrillic letters spelled up. Bang, bang, here comes a train in Belarusian. 
Maxime and Anton read the title together, then Maxime opened the story. For Katarina, may your train always roll on, Maxime said. By Edward Nikolaevich Opsensky, printed in Tom's Old Russian Federation by Sibia Publishing Company, or Corporation, he flipped the page. Bang, bang, bangity, bang, he cried, the friendly train is on the ride. Crack, crack, crickety, crack, the hard-working hammer gave no slack. Ouch, ouch, ouchy, ouch, the lazy nails get off the couch. Swish, 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 shitty, swish, the mighty saw offers a swish. Yay, yay, happy, yay, that's what the friendly people say. They love their train, they love their rides. That swing them all from side to side. They hung the hammer and kiss a saw, and not say a word of the nails, many flaws. The end. I like trains, little Anton said. When I grow up, I want to help build train tracks just like you, Daddy. Maxim smiled. No, laying tracks no fun. You should be a conductor or a train engineer. That would be fun. If I dream about trains again, do you want to hear about it? Anton asks. Of course, my son, Maxim said. Anything for you. And a new day in an old city. Anton had come along with him from Tomsky, though. All this time, he marched and finally paid off. There he stood in the middle of a now nameless street in the once great city of Minsk, which was reduced to the ashes when he and the rest of the army came along. Now, he is stationed along their side of garrison, at the heart of the old Belarus, but also one that was struck, struck the hardest. A German influence is seen from all over, of course. From the architecture to the signs, and especially all the settlers in the area, they made him uneasy, um, thinking about how horrible the place was before they showed up. Despite this, he heard tales from some soldiers stationed in other neighborhoods, about how a lot of the Belarusians didn't enjoy having the houses blown up. But it's just a private, he thought. So Anton didn't worry too much about anything like that happening. He could just direct them to his superiors, and watch a shit show unfold. I'm sorry. He cracked a wry grin as he thought passed through his mind. He passed through the city, essentially off-duty, but still wearing his military fatigues and carrying his rifle. With the reconstruction going on, he must be alert at all times, or so the commanders tell him. Anton thought the city was doing just fine, especially considering how happy the people seemed to be at the Germans being kicked out. As he thought of all this, a uh, scent waved by him, something warm and impossibly comforting. He immediately followed the scent down the street, checking each corner and alleyway, and passing by several soldiers, eating the very thing he craved out of the mass of bulls. His stomach began to rumble whether or not he was hungry before, he surely was now. Eventually, he arrived at what initially appeared to be a meager stall, with an old man probably in his 60s or 70s and a young woman. Around the stall sat many soldiers, once again eating the same delight. Anton had been looking for him, without hesitation. He approached the stall, noting the gargantuan pots and pans with delicious concoctions for cooking inside them. Better than my grandmother's, he says. And we rebuilt in the Baltic states. The Baltic states were har hit harder than any other region in Eastern Europe. Their lands were heavily colonized, Germans becoming the majority in several major settlements. The identities and cultures of the Baltic states were nearly erased, gone to the pages of history. That's what the god had planned for the Baltics, as our brave sons of the all-Russian army tore through the Ostland auxiliaries and captured the city of Riga. With the Treaty of Riga, the artificial state of Ostland was destroyed, and for the first time in decades, the Baltic had returned to the map of Europe. Our efforts in Western Russia proven that it was not too late to save the native cultures of Eastern Europe. We can help the Baltic states bring back the culture and make the region more than just a place in Europe. Rebuilding Lithuania. Yeah, Lithuania was one of the first regions in the old Soviet Union to follow the German advance, leaving much of the land devastated. The Austrian Civil War only made the devastation worse. While predominantly German towns and neighborhoods have been fully restored, much of Lithuania still remains dilapidated and ruined, unlike the Reich. The Federation cares about the terrible conditions that the Lithuanian people are forced to endure, slowly but surely. We will help rebuild this region and bring to the people a living standard near equal to that of the Federation itself, and reopen the Sialili... I don't know how to pronounce that. Those mines, an S-word. Near in the reign of the Reich, the Sialia Moon Mines, or the Shawan Mines, as the Germans called it, was a major part of Austin's mining industry, exporting minerals and other raw materials that supported both the Reichs Commissariat and, of course, the Reich. The working conditions, however, were horrifyingly terrible, with the enslaved Lithuanians being forced to use crude, inefficient tools and dangerous machinery in order to exploit the resources of the land. <clears throat> we shall reopen these mines to help the economy of Lithuania recover, but the story here will be much different, of course. Uh, no longer will workers have to risk life and limb for resources. We'll ensure that the modern tools and machinery are supplied to the workers, and the hours are reasonable and that they are actually paid adequately for the labor. Combat German cultural influence. Lithuania, while not losing entire regions of Germany, German colonization, has home to a large German majority that, under the Reich, held massive sway in the politics and, in turn, a culture of the region which is a strange amalgamation of the two cultures, making Lithuania seem almost identical to German. Almost. Given enough time, we can employ similar techniques uh, we've used in Western Russia to reverse the cultural damage done by the Germans and truly bring Lithuania back to life, rebuilding Latvia. Uh, well, under the oppression of the Germans, the Latvia, much like their southern neighbor, Lithuania, endured decades of colonization and cultural suppression. Whilst the Latvians were able to hold on to the culture, they received more settlers than the other Baltic states, losing the entire province of Kurzem to German colonization, the abysmal. The living conditions of Lithuania dropped even further with the outbreak of the Austrian Civil War. Thousands of Latvians were displaced, with many losing their homes. Throughout Latvia, homelessness is still a significant problem. While we cannot solve all of Latvia's issues in a single day, we can support the economic recovery of the region, supporting the new industrial projects so that the people can find jobs and lift themselves out of poverty. Our true names. They were listening closely to every student ahead of him, announced loud and proud of the Lithuanian name. Even Hans was no longer. It was no... Dovidas. 
and no one including Liebert would doubt him with a conviction in his voice. Now the bright sun beating down on him through a window, the names were being presented one by one. Polinus, Tabas, Galati, Lina, uh, uh, Aldona, Gabija. And you, said the teacher, and suddenly Liebert was given a great shame. He felt a sen great sensation to throw up and struggle to swallow the oncoming shame. Ma and my parents didn't get a chance to give me a native name. They passed during the fighting, and my older brother was too busy to suggest one. The teacher looked in a way that re reminded Liebert of his mother when she looked out of the window of their house. The teacher gave a short pause and said, Well, that's okay. That just means you can pick one. If you're interested, you can stay after class for a bit and we can chat about it. Liebert felt as if weights were lifted and tried to listen to whatever the teacher had to say for the day. He owned that much to her. Owed that much to her. At the end of his first writing, a written Lithuanian lesson, the teacher gave one great speech. It's okay if you don't understand everything today, but you've all taken the first step in the rebirth of our Lithuanian culture. One day, the weights of the newfound freedom will rest on all of your shoulders, and with today's lessons, our future can become even more bright than today. Liebert and the teacher chatted, and he expressed that the teacher's brief speech spoke to him, so the teacher gave him one more suggestion. Since you seem so to value your language so deeply, then perhaps your name could be something like Jonas. Jonas Jablonski was an important figure in creating your language, and with students like you, you could continue that legacy. And on the day, Liebert was forgotten by Jonas and the Countess proposal. In a radio, radio debate for Radio Vilnius, Ringaldus Songalia victoriously defended ascension into the Federation, making the following arguments. Like so many others, I love our nation. And to love one's nation, you have to wait and want to do it well. There are many opponents of ascension. At fears of Russian intrusion in our state, others want to depend on a tri republic to defend our interests. Defenders of both arguments are, to put it bluntly, misguided. <clears throat> The Russians didn't need to march into Riga to ensure their victory. Thousands bled and died for people to become free. Their willingness to fight demonstrates that the Russians have stepped forth into our lands are far from bloodthirsty tyrants. They're interested in our freedoms, and we can see that not only in their willingness to fight for us. Look at the various autonomous republics of Siberia. Have the Yakuts of Boryats become any less after their, their, their integration into the Russian Federation? After the autonomous republic system that was slushed out, they received funds to teach their language, their cities reclaimed their native t names, and are treated as equals. We can see that they've become active members of the Federation. Many of those Yakuts and Boryats came into our nation to force the German menace out. Here in Lithuania, we can look at the very process in action. The Russians came, and instead of forcing everyone to learn Russian, they're teaching our native language tongue to our children. Furthermore, we've talked to the Russian officials, they mean to grant us even more control over education, laws, budgets, and even government. We can vote for our public's president, who will be able to exert more power through the Federation beyond our native lands. Does that sound like oppression? What value is freedom in isolation and the jewel of the Baltic Sea? <coughs> the Latvian city of Riga is the largest city in the former Ostland. It was a administrative center of the former Rakhsko Masaret and is the current home of the military administration of the Baltic Reconstruction Zone. The fact doesn't mean Riga is the most pristine city in the Baltic states. The Latvian natives that live in the cities have been relegated to the ghettos, being left to rot while the German zones have prospered. The Ostlands of War did not make things better. Riga can be better. Given enough time and investment, the Federation can help the city of Riga rebuild and recover from the legacy of German rule and bring its title as a jewel of the Baltic Sea, new meaning and glory. Latvian cultural renaissance. With the Germans gone, the lands blessed with more gifts of freedom, the Latvian people now feel more comfortable in expressing their culture than ever before. In the streets, the people are setting up cultural festivities all on their own in Riga. New markets have been set up, selling food that had once been a staple of Latvian culture, tradition, and identity. The people have taken it upon themselves to restore their own landmarks like much we had in Moscow. Latvia's new golden age is upon them, and thus they support uh, the support of the Federation in the glorious cultural renaissance. Rebuilding Estonia. But let's talk about uh, uh, Riga first. The Pearl of the Baltics. Edgar looked out across the sea, scanning the horizon for hours, even though he knew precisely when the cargo would come in. As the sun beamed down, Edgar saw the ship from Stockholm, a dark and yet still white painted plaster across the side that simply said Astrid. Once Edgar saw it, he passed around the docks with almost childlike glee, preparing his best Swedish. As the ship came into port, Edgar wanted to meet the Swedish merchant crew and shake hands with the first vessel in Riga that wasn't the Germans. Soon enough, his chance appeared, and an old bearded Swedish man stepped down from the ramparts and met with the Latvian and the new few Russians around. The ship had several tons of food, mechanized tractors, as well as radios and even a few TVs. Edgar's last memory of television was when the Germans, during their retreat, took everything of value out when the Russians were starting going, starting going door by door for German stragglers. The Swedes spoke up again. There should be another ship bringing in goods every other day. We brought even some crews to help teach locals and repair the port for trade. From what I understand, there will be Americans here soon, correct? Edgar nodded. Yes, yes, we have a lot of work to do to lift ourselves out of the horror of the last 30 years, but besides that, there's something we have always wanted to say. The port workers all prepared to speak almost as if, we, as if they planned what was to happen next, and with a bell and a pride they had said to it, Welcome to Latvia. Restoration Day. We've got to go now, we'll miss it. Yvette was trying her hardest to show off her new pair of shoes her parents bought her, while Christine combed her unruly hair. Jurus waited by the door, egging his two friends on. When the trio finished dressing the best clothing they'd gotten their hands on for years, they embarked on the Daugava Riverfront. The trio ran as fast as they could over the bombed out streets, bomb strewn rubble, and smoking craters, exchanging jokes and laughter the whole way after a dozen minutes. The trio arrived at the front river, a riverfront. See, I told you we'd be fine. They haven't even turned the bend yet, Christine said. Yvette and Juris rolled their eyes with a smile. We listen to you every time. We'd be late more than we have ever had right to be, Yvette said. The trio chuckled and leaned against the railing over the river. 
As the evening played on, Juris watched about this closely, but Christina and Ivetha kept exchanging glances and hushed words. Juris didn't care too much about it, he desperately wanted to see the ship celebrating Latvian history sail by. At the end of the night, the Jew watched fireworks shoot in the dark sky, a brilliant flames that ended with the colors of the reborn Latvian nation. Now they were free of German oppression. The three felt that the deep freedom stirred up in their souls, a hope stirred in their hearts, and they knew what ever happened next. They knew that their people and their homeland had left the darkness of the past behind, and so when Christina and Ivetha started to hold hands, Juris's mind turned only to the bright future ahead of them all. Freedom from oppression means freedom to love. The Riga Proposal Page 3 in the Baltic Times, we cannot in good faith urge for complete independent republics for each of the Baltic republics, but we can also not believe that we should join the Russians in their federation project. Even assuming the Russians are acting in the best of faith, our nations will become no more than another of their oblasts purely due to the size of their economy and their population in 100 years. The Baltic peoples would speak only Russian. People from Vilnius to Tallinn would work on Moscow time and disperse themselves across the federation. This is simply the reality of the situation, and many would call it prosperity. This isn't, however, an endorsement of each nation rebirthing their own independent republic. That would risk ineffectual results. A desire to be truly independent and free of all national constraints is a luring one, but consider what that means. Each republic will have to depend upon itself to maintain its basic functions. Our economic recovery would slow down. It would be much poorer than the Federation, and the scars of German rule would last longer. While no one argues for removing ourselves from the security arrangement we have with Russia, dependency is the death of any truly sovereign people. As such, I propose a compromise of position. <clears throat> Our three republics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, share a great deal in common. We've weathered the storms of countless invaders and rulers, and now we stand after the greatest crime in all of history was conducted on our very land. We, who have so many dark memories and horror stories, share a common bond of unity in the face of such disasters. Our common path ties us together. If there's one thing we can take into our future, let it be that shared legacy. Let us form our confederation, guided not by Muscovy, but one of cooperation between our peoples. Together we can fund our roads, our schools, and our freedom, but let us work together and create a new Baltic way. The Baltics are waking up with the rebuilding Estonia. The people of Estonia did not enter a colonization to the same extent as Lithuania and Latvia did, but Estonia still suffered under the rule of the Reichskommissar at Austin, where the culture and language suppressed and their homes destroyed by the Austin Civil War and the Second West Russian War. The Federation is not the enemy of the Estonian people. We must support their reconstruction efforts to show the people that the new Russia is indeed a better Russia. With the proper investment and industrial assistance, Estonia should be able to industrialize and recover much faster than its Baltic kin. Sponsor infrastructure projects. Much of Estonia is covered in forests, which is not in is easy to develop as a vast plains of Russia. This makes connecting the various minor settlements of Estonia rather frustrating, which only hampers our regional reconstruction efforts. General Ivan Tharasov, the head of the military administration of Estonia, has requested the reinvest in Estonian railway and, and road projects to make uh, to better connect the lands <clears throat> of Estonia, make our efforts in the land both quicker and, of course, easier. Which would be nice. Estonian linguistic classes. <coughs> While the majority of Estonians are able to read and speak the na native language of Estonian, a significant minority, particularly young Estonians, are unable to speak it as well as their fellow Estonians. By helping them establish new schools and major settlements such as Tallinn and Tartu, we can help the young reconnect with the culture and language. The legacy of Germany is quickly fading, and the wounds left behind are healing the people of Estonia are rising once more. The future of the Baltic States. The economy and industry now identity of the Baltic states have been restored, narrowly avoiding its integration into the Reich. With this in mind, the time has come to determine the Baltic's place in the Federation moving forward and redraw some of the map of the Baltic states for decades to come. While it may be advantageous for the Federation to integrate the Baltic states, some believe the Baltic peoples preserve a chance to finally rule themselves, you know, whether they be united as one Baltic Confederation or divided into the respective states. What will the future of the Baltic states be on a day on the railroad? Deep within the Estonian forest, a tent sat brightly lit from within, inside 24 Estonians, and a couple of Russians stood around a table. Looking over the map, and a Russian named Vladimir spoke up. Here and here were areas of heavy fighting. We need minesweeper recruits to clear the area of any remaining explosives, and painting that, we can start repairing the rail line in Narva. Also, since many of you don't have experience maintaining and rebuilding rail lines, those of seniority will be distributed among you to educate and teach. Understand? Within each group, introductions began, all sharing a distinct but familiar story. My house was bombed years ago, one man said. Every day I had to pretend to be someone I wasn't, another said. Once a month, a German would come by and check on my mother. When the day started, they all had been strangers, and by the end, all bonded over their desire to rebuild their continent. And so the Estonians and Russians got to work that very night, rebuilding a railroad bomb for the second time in a decade, for a future that finally shone with hope. Fraternity and a common struggle makes fast friends. The Tallinn and Proposal. Why would we ever bow to become an autonomous republic of the Russian Federation? Have you forgotten that the Kremlin has historically been our greatest oppressor? We can be grateful for the liberation without bending ourselves into a foreign federation. We already maintain. The security arrangement is necessary to prevent another German invasion, and we can lift our nation out from the Reich's shadow by ourselves. We sit on the Baltic Sea. And unless we check, the Germans haven't darned it up yet, or damned it up, meaning we have access to global trade routes. We do not need to become a Russian vassal to escape poverty, or people must rediscover how to be a sovereign people or a redevelopment. That can't come if we must bow and escape to Moscow every time we want to pass a, few, uh, pass a law. 
How can we expect the Russians to help us develop our language, our music, and our culture? The answer to these questions is simple. We must restore the old borders and let our people develop freely and independently of foreign influence. To block our borders to potential Russian immigration so we can truly develop a nation of our own people. Nations uh, dedicated not just to Estonian idea, but Latvian and Lithuanian as well. You may be our ally, but you cannot own us. The future of the Baltic states. With the reconstruction in the Baltic states concluding and the three cultures of the region now were born, the time has come to decide what the fate of the Baltic states for the coming decades to come. While many members of the government have called for the complete annexation of the Baltic Reconstruction Zone, some have argued that an independent Baltic would be more advantageous. That argument has been divided into two camps, with some supporting a Baltic Confederation, while others back a three-state solution. It would appear that the future of the Baltic states now rests on the president of Sh President Shukshin. Integrate them? I would love that. Establish Baltic Confederation is okay. A three-state solution, of course, would probably work best, as now we'll take off the cons commands and actually take, read these normally. Um, Brother Reconstruction. Did I read this one earlier? Yeah, I read this one earlier too, so Hakiv Blues, and then restore the Ukrainian identity. The identity of Ukraine has been shaken, to say the least. Centuries of harsh Tsarist rule, decades of Soviet rule, followed by decades of more of German rule, and the attempted colonization has left scars which do not heal easily. Fortunately, we're here not we're not here to subject Ukraine to Russification, nor are we here to colonize our lands. We are beginning a new relationship with the people of Ukraine. Not one of subject to master, but of two Eastern European brothers. Let us help our European brother reconnect with his cultural and traditional roots and assist the people in finding what it truly means to be Ukrainian. Kharkiv Blues, a oh, crap, the voice rang out, and among the rubble, the men and women turned on to see a man seemingly swallowed by the remains of the building. Mere seconds later, a woman hopes, uh, hops across the rubble and attempts to clown the man down. A few minutes passed, and the man was freed from the ruins and turned to his new, th new thank his newfound hero. Oh, thanks, man. What's your name? The woman responded, and accent he was well aware of being Russian. Elena, the man, now smiling, said, Well, thank you, Elena. I'm Artyom. I'm living here, and I don't think you do any more, judging by how you just nearly fell. Artyom was taken aback. It was surprised how she acted, but continued nonetheless. Huh, very much true, but as I was saying before, I'm glad you are here to help. Where did all of you come from anyways? Much of us came from Belgo Belgorod. We are finishing out cleaning the damage early, and as such, we were asking if we could lend a hand here. Artyom already had the slightest tink twinkle, twinkle, tinkle in his eye. Tinkle? Probably twinkle in his eye. And the two of them here set off to work off the remainder of the day, clearing up the city of Kharkiv. As they finished their shift of the day, Artyom prepared to say goodbye, but once again is taken off guard. The place we're staying at, they're playing a week... Playing a recently made film about the Battle of Minsk. Would you like to come over and watch it with me? I'd love no nothing more. And demand Odessa. Ooh. During the Second uh, World War, Ukrainian provinces of Odessa and Nistrenia were annexed by the Romanians. Although they had been torn away from their mother country, the people living there were content to live under Romanian rule, who were very much more beloved than the Germans who did it in killing them and turning them all Slavs into slaves of the Reich. With the Ukraine now liberated from the German rule, however, the Ukrainians living in its land now wish to rejoin the mother country. Retaking these lands would help boost their popularity in Ukraine and make the Ukrainian people more receptive to the Federation, of course. Oh, no more money. So uh, we're basically retracking kind of this, but we're sort of not, so it kind of sucks. But it's okay. Oh, they're starting Lithuanian culture. Make Lithuanian the official language. Uh, Lithuania is more Lithuanian than it has been ever before. It's time we would finally restore Lithuania as the official language of the region and make Lithuania truly Lithuanian again. Uh. Well, also, I did basically re reload the save ish, sort of. But now at least we have these two countries here. We still have to annex Belarus, which sucks a lot. But, uh. At least these guys are back here. Also, Estonia is led by this guy. And then we have Valdes Barkavs in uh, Latvia, in Lithuania, also has these guys. Also, um, they have Cultural Resurgence, they have a Colonial Pass, unfortunately. Um, they also have Pearl of the Baltic, as well as Letten Deutsche. And then Estonia has a Shale Oil Industry, but the Nipper Organization. Videro Kovalenko was enjoying a cup of afternoon tea when a knock came at his door. The old man's knees ached as he shuffled to the door. Coming, he fumbled with the lock, cursing under his breath until he finally forced the door open. Fedor's eyes lit up in surprise. Kasia, he staggered forward to embrace his old student. I haven't seen you in my god eight years. You've grown. Kasia, now a man in his early twenties with a red streak beard, smiled. I've missed you, teacher. I hope you don't mind, but I brought someone here for you to meet. This is Choi Ji Yu. Uh, <clears throat> Fedor looked over the man, young man's shoulder, his eyes narrowing in suspicion. As if the visitor was too old, it was old too, perhaps, in his early 60s, clean-shaven and clearly not, not from Ukraine. I assume you have come from business here, Mr. Choi, Fedor said. G.U. bowed, smiling politely. I fear I met your people's request, Mr. Kovalenko. Mr. Choi is a scholar of the Korean language, Kasia said, just as you've mastered Ukrainian. He smiled as I glanced for a moment at the sun. When he told me to speak my native tongue, it changed my entire world. For the first time, I felt as though I had some connection to the world we've lost, or to those we've lost, my mother. He gulped. I wanted to be able to do that for her others. To try and rebuild Ukraine's culture in some um, organized, systematic fashion. I'm calling the Nipper Organization. Fedea raised an eyebrow. Go on. <coughs> I'm trying to recruit men and women who are willing to teach Eastern European languages. And her old ways to the young. Not just Ukrainian, but Belarusian. Polish, Slovakian, any culture that has been attacked by the fascists. We need to encourage joint cultural ventures and understand the origins of our tongues, pursue conservation and revitalization of the Slavic languages. 
Fidera interrupted the young man with a raised hand. With how many have you recruited? Ji Yu laughed so far. Only me. Kovalenko shook his head, smiling. I'd really prefer to end my days with a cup of tea in peace, but if these old bones can help, count me in. This will begin to make things right. The Ukrainian language. Much like Western Russia, Ukrainians endured the, endured the attempts, attempted Germanization of their nation as a hands through thorough, uh, thorough through their attempted colonization via General Plan Ost. While well, Ukraine has become has been more successful in retaining its language and cultural traditions than our Muscovite counterpart, there is much damage done that needs to be repaired in order to bring about the rebirth of Ukrainian identity. Uh, the issue of Odessa. I met Konstad, rubbing his dark ringed eyes with the pale fingertips. He closed the manila folder he'd been reading and placed it on the President Shukshin's desk. But silly, would you care to enlighten me as to why on earth we're demanding Odessa from the Romanians? We're still rebuilding Ukraine. Why are we provoking another nation? Well, Shukshin uh, laced his fingertips. It's not about conflict, my friend. It's about showing the people of Ukraine we care about them and that the Federation's fighting for their interests. Ukraine has agitated to reclaim Odessa for years. But under the Germans, they couldn't do anything about their brothers trapped across an arbitrary border. It's a perfect opportunity to gain the trust. If we can get Odessa back for them, it'll make working with the Ukrainians much, much easier. I met Khan across his arms and took a deep breath, so this is about pacifying the Ukrainians. It's about showing them that we're looking out for their interests, yes. <clears throat> And we can't do that with another war. Minister Sultan shook his head. Vasily, people are going to die. Good people, I understand fighting against Nazis, but you and I both know that the Iron Guard government is collapsing. Surely there must be a better way. Shukshin slammed his fist on the table. You think we can trust the Romanians? They threw that lot of the Germans, slaughtering our people, murdering babies and old women. The Ukrainians are our people, and they'll never be safe as long as they're under those thugs. Rule. Vasily told me yourself you had to use pre the presidency to set precedent. What sort of legacy will this invasion leave for the future? Shushin took a deep breath, balling his fist beneath the table. The world will see that democracy is strong, that we won't roll over and allow our people to be oppressed. And if you don't agree with that, I'll find someone who does into the history books. To many under the rule of the Reich, Ukraine was a land of many contrasts. Many groups from the German government, the Ukrainian collaborators to the industrious, all vie for power and influence with the former Reich's commissariat, all that came at the expense of the people, even the, even the German settlers, oddly enough. Well, like I see the decades of political conflict still have an effect on the Ukrainian psyche. With these groups either dead or the power significantly reduced, we can begin to establish a uh, government the Ukrainian people can finally put their faith in and leave the turmoil of the past to the history books. Despite the odds being heavily in our favor, the sovereign Romanians have refused to return to Odessa and Nistrenia. This presents us with two options. We can forget about Odessa and face the embarrassment of Bucharest's rejections of our terms, or we can mobilize our numerically superior forces and liberate the Romanian occupied lands by force. I'd like to do that one, but we're going to do this one because, uh, uh, well, I was going to decrease this anyways. Mobilize the army for war? What if we choose that one? Oh, we just go straight to war with them. Oh, well, crap. That's not good. Um, the history books, of course. And the future of Ukraine. With the continued assistance of the Federation, Ukraine is well on its way to recovery. With this comes the question of their place in the post-war Eastern Europe. Ukrainians consider the breadbasket of Europe and shares a language similar to Russian, but only the nation has enjoyed a much higher level of autonomy than under the Reich. After all these years, of doesn't Ukraine deserve its freedom? What will the future of Ukraine be? But I wonder about, oh, if you wonder about the, us invading Romania, please go ahead for the liberation of Odessa. But we're going to talk about, uh, <clears throat> first aid school first. Oh, look at that. They still have quite a few divisions, but they're not that strong. Is it just them? It's just them. What do we call it all of our allies in? Could our allies actually take them out? Hmm, maybe. Maybe not. If we have to do this by ourselves, then so be it. Andre woke at the crack of dawn to the sound of his father's voice. Andre, come here, the farmer yelled. I have something to show you. The boy lurched out of bed into the tiny kitchen, boards creaking under his feet. When he did, he could see his father beyond excited holding something behind him. Papa, what are you holding? You'll see soon enough. Now come eat some breakfast with me. Andre sat down to his, next to his parents, the earliest glow of the sun streaming past the horizon. Mama prepared three steaming bowls of kasha, doused in honey and milk. Her cheeks were red and her eyes watered. He frowned and said, everything all right, Mama. She smiled and waved him off. Of course, little one, now eat your breakfast. It's going to be a busy day ahead. Andre shoved a spoonful of kasha into his mouth. Uh, what chores do you want me to do today, Papa? A bit of food trickled out of his mouth. Don't talk with your mouth so full, son. His father took a breath. Ah, oh, there's something important I need to tell you. You won't be doing chores today. He took Mama's hand in his own. Starting today, you'll be going to school. School? But what about the farm? Your mother and I will manage, but you need new, to meet new friends. Learn to read and write. Better yourself. You can't spend all your life in one cabin plowing a field like I did. He smiled. I got something for you. From behind his back, he pulled a well-made backpack. Clearly American design. It even had a logo. We were able to t uh, talk to one of the... Uh, new shop owners into letting his buy one for you. He'd hold it. Andre gasped as he slid his hands over the strap. This was one of the most expensive items he'd ever touched. Inside, a few notebooks and a couple of pencils lay ready, sharp, and prepared to jot down whatever needed to be written. He laughed and embraced his mother and father. Thank you, thank you, I promise I won't let you down. We know you do your best, son. To your history books and rebuilding Caucasia. Caucasia has been devastated from the decades of occupation in the recent European, uh, Eastern European conflict. With peace returning to Eastern Europe, it's time to recommence, commence a reconstruction of this region and restore this proud land back to its former glory. Of course, that would be good to do as well. Um, of course, we're going to read about the history books. 
and seeing what these guys can do. Like, can we actually take these guys out? That'd be kind of fun if we could. Here, let's just deploy these guys. You know what? We actually might be able to do this. And I apologize for this. I was just trying to save money, too. Um, who's good on attack? Andre Kastarev. That's fine. Here, come over here. Oh, the guys are attacking. We could try it right now, too, anyways. Screw it, why not? Why not? Back at war, my friends. Of course, what? Of course not. Why not? Really surplus? Oh, we need 50 PP for that. Whatever. Order a bombing run. Do the history books. Future of Ukraine. Russia and his people. Kuzma finds it hard to pay attention to the teacher's lecture. He clenches his fist, try and drink a little bit of his mother's coffee before going to school, and try as hard as to pay attention. However, every time his eyes wandered off the small tent school they had to, uh, they had into the nearby building that was their school. It was several months from completion, but when the family heard what the new government would teach Ukrainian, parents demanded that their children head to school at their earliest convenience. Kuzma, on the other hand, had hoped to spend at least a few more weeks going, goofing off before having such responsibilities like going to school. He recalled his parents stating, not once. Uh, not the one once of German ounce of German would be left in what you finished your first year. So now he was stuck in school, watching the freshly painted locomotive place in enormous brooks for the first for the town's first school, while his teacher lectured in the background. Kuzma was so lost in thought he didn't even notice when the teacher changed topics from mathematics to local history. No matter your shared background or history, there's one thing all Eastern Europe shares. <clears throat> Massive battles to decide the fate of empires right over there, in that very field. As well, the Battle of Poltava took place. The Russian Tsar, Peter the Great, spectacular, spectacularly defeated the Swedish army, and will soon afterwards start what historians would have called the Russian Golden Age. You mean this isn't the first time the town had to be rebuffed from scratch, thought Kuzma? Nonetheless, for once, he actually listened to the entire lecture. By the end of the day, Kuzma was called up before he could leave, the, leave by the teacher. Uh, Kuzma noticed that you were paying extra attention today during the history lecture. Do you find that sort of thing interesting? Kuzma gave a quick nod, and then the teacher reached underneath his makeshift table and pulled out a book. Here, Kuzma. Uh, it's a book about the history of our nation, one of his first freshly printed books for the entire country, and you can go ahead and uh, uh, the others if you're interested in reading about it. Kuzma was already glazing over whatever the teacher was saying and was looking through the book that was simply titled The History of Russia and Its People, across a solid blue color, which had a black imprint of a giant bear cross. He cracked the book open and immediately struggled to read the bigger words, but as soon as he saw them, he knew he had to learn what it said. Kuzma expressed great thanks and ran off home, ignoring his friends Andre and Anna waving to him on the way and sat right underneath a tree that stood outside his home, many people's one nation in the future of Ukraine. Reconstruction in Ukraine. As, uh, nearing its conclusion, and with that come determining Ukraine's place in the new Eastern Europe, there have been a lot of arguments for Ukraine to maintain its independence as the region has, has some level of self-rule, albeit very limited for a few decades now, and reintegrating Ukraine would be only upsetting the status quo. The future of Ukraine now rests on the shoulders of President Shukshin himself. I want to do that one, but it deserves its independence. As long as you're with us, right? As a client state of us. Oh, not their war. The oil crisis, of course. The breadbasket of Europe is very nice, as well as Nezalesnitsk. So, interesting. Oh, hello. Oh, you actually got them done, huh? Oh, okay, so that makes more sense then. There you go. I apologize for screwing up this campaign sort of issue. Like, I mean, obviously, I shouldn't have deleted all the divisions, but I didn't know what was going on. And, uh, yeah. Go all the way, my boys. Rebuilding a Caucasia. <coughs> it's just an episode dedicated to the Eastern European brothers. That's okay with me. Obviously, it's okay with me. Should be able to go in and do whatever we need to. Ah, uh, what's next? Construct a new administration. The administration of Caucasia was uh, devastated as the all-Russian army advanced through the plains of northern Caucasia. While the reconstruction government under General Mikhail Baganov has managed to maintain its authority, it has become clear that a new government needs to be built from the ground up before the local warlords that have invested Caucasia become too powerful for a military to be dealt with. Show the world their crimes. Caucasia had been scarred deeply by the decades-long occupation by Nazi forces. Millions of native Caucasians from Georgians to Azerbaijanis were massacred, tortured, segregated by the German administration that kept their operations in the region's secret to those beyond the borders of the Reich. The world will show no sympathy towards the German people in Eastern Europe, once the crimes have been revealed to the world, of course. Even rebuilding an army from scrap, we can still do great. Demand Romania surrender. Uh, we could. Or we could keep going. And we did this one earlier, so President Shukshin has my vote. Um, and over here, we're going to go and do hold a rally like we did in the previous episode. I apologize about this. We're going to go work through all this stuff, and then we'll like get all that stuff done. So, 
the secrets of Krasnodar. It was another sunny afternoon in the liberated lands of what used to be Caucasia. Juno Mikhail Baganov now has decided to spend the day out on the streets amongst the native people of the city. As Mikhail wondered, his heart pained upon seeing how the Caucasians interacted with one another. Back home in Russia, the streets were always alive with music and lively conversation. The people of Krasnodar seemed distant from one another. They have isolated themselves as they not draw attention to themselves. Just how badly had the Germans broken these people? Was the Federation up to the task of bringing hope back to these sheltered lands, or shattered lands, was he? But the president had personally asked him to lead the new Caucasian administration, and Baganov thought he was up to the task. The Federation had managed to pull the largest nation back on Earth. Together, how hard could rebuilding a smaller region be? After seeing how just so broken the land of the former German Caucasia was, he just realized how little he knew about putting things back together. Caucasia wasn't like Russia. The fields, towns, and cities weren't the only thing that needed fixing. The people need healing. Spirits had to be mended. Social barriers would break down and cultures would be revitalized. The Germans have ruled for so long was fixing a, such a catastrophe. Was it possible to do this? Baganov shook his head and signed to himself. Everyone uh, thought uniting Russia was impossible, yet here Russia stood. Everyone thought Germany would easily win again, yet here Russia stood. The aging general looked at the people surrounding him with a look of determination in his eyes. There was no challenge too great for the Federation. It would help these people no matter what. There are no people too broken to help. Destroy his legacy. The foul hemorrhage, Josiah Zubaldak and Piermont has turned the once vibrant lands of Caucasia into the land of pain and despair, oppressing the people and exploiting the land for his Nazi masters in Germania. Such an evil must never be allowed to rise again uh, through, uh, throughout Caucasia. We shall spread the truth of his atrocities, show the people his crimes, and ensure that the dark stain he has left in his history, in history will be remembered with disdain and hatred by all those who speak of him. Ah, you good job, you Russia. We got it back. Okay. I was expecting us to get it, but whatever. Oh, so now we can probably do... Man, they're really deep inside us, aren't they? We're gonna get this back. At the very least, we need this back. The F uh, Russian Federation triumphs over Romania, of course, as we should. Uh, the fate of our brother demand surrender. Uh, final strike, of course. Shocking news has emerged from Europe as the Russian Federation is completely, completely occupied Romania. But what was originally conflict over the lands of Odessa and Nistria. Nistrenia, which are heavily populated by Ukrainians, while the Russian armies continue to advance, capturing Bucharest and establishing a friendly government. Many nations, predominantly Germany, has been vocal about the Russian Federation's war on Romania, referring to the rising Russian state as a threat to the unstable balance of power in Europe, taking advantage of smaller European countries unable to defend themselves. The Russian Federation stated that the Russian Federation would have preferred to take the original demands, but the Romanians refused to surrender, left the government no choice but to continue to occupy the nation uh, and remove the previous war-mongering government from power. They left us with no choice. Uh... We saved, right? Just in case I need to redo all this so I can give that land back to them. June, yeah, we're, we're okay. I'm gonna have to replay this again, again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Oh my god. Cool. And the final strike again. And there you go. Nice. Oh, I forgot about this too. Hold rally. <coughs> oh, we can actually do. The, okay, so that's cool. We can actually do the Muscovy district now too, as well as the Kuban district. That's interesting. As the world turns. Across America, uh, across the orphan, a familiar face is beaming into the millions of living rooms. Good evening, I'm Walter Cronkite, the newsman said. These ruins are in Baku, the former capital of Azerbaijan. They are left here by the act of war. Hundreds died here. Here in these ruins can be seen physical evidence of the Third Reich's occupation and colonization of the people of Europe. But far less tangible are what these ruins mean, and like everything else in this burned and blasted and weary land, they mean survival or extermination, life or death, depending on who you talk to. The camera cuts to an Azerbaijani man, dressed in a gray suit and tie. He speaks as a representative of the Caucasian Reconstruction Zone. I think he says in heavily accented English, people must realize what we suffered as a people before we can heal. There's no security, not even in your own home, in the heart of your city. The assets will come to your door and knock on your door and just kill you instantly. The camera cuts back to Cronkite, who stands in a dusty street next to a bombed out car. There are doubts about the exact measures of the disaster itself. How many died, how much damage was done, are still but approximations, despite the official figures offered by the Third Reich. Russian officials estimated the death toll across Caucasia in the millions, perhaps more. Anyone who has wondered through these ruins know that the exact account is impossible. Why, just a short while ago, an old man came and told us two children were buried in a hastily dug grave. Uh, dug, g dug, hastily dug up grave at the end of the block. And what about these ruins? Have they ever gone through all of them for all the buried civilians and soldiers and what about the 14 azeri men who we found in the courtyard behind the post office have they been counted they certainly haven't been buried the part camera pans out beyond concrete smoke is billowing from an apartment building at least it was an apartment building now it looks more akin to a tower of blocks pushed over by a frustrated toddler we came here to Caucasia to, to determine what this all means to the future of our world. Now since the bombing of Pearl Harbor has the barbarity and evil of national socialist thought been so clear to the people of the Earth, the Germania line, that the Russians are in some way engaging in ethnic cleansing or racial war against the German people is not born out of evidence. In fact, it is the Russian Federation who is engaged with this war in the best tradition of mankind as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. And that's the way it is. Free the people. 
For too long, Caucasia has been segregated into an ethnic hierarchy by the colonial government with very few German settlers living in Caucasia at the very top, whilst the majority were forced to toil in the mines and oil fields. It's time we completely dismantle what remains of the Burgundian policy to separate the people for decades and bring them to the one thing they've been yearning for, freedom. And you get the Georgian and the Azerbaijanis, as we will first read about in the Mountain of Madness. It's weird we don't have the event to like give them this territory. That's very weird. More production, so I guess. Build, 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 I guess. How's the economy looking? Five billion. Not bad, not bad, not bad, not bad. You're really deficit I don't like, though, but whatever. Oh, well. No, no more military, stri military austerity. Oh, well. Destroy his legacy. <coughs> Josias du Piermont, Eduard Deisenhofer, Paul Fleiger, Hans Kari, Karl Heinz Berger. These were the names of criminals, not supermen. They were the names of barbarians, not civilizers. These are not their names worth remembering. <coughs> Across the Caucasus, these petty tyrants have made themselves into gods. The fascist vandals poured concrete temples and forged steel mosques, and dedicated the future structures to their own names, like the Cath uh, no, Chthonic deities of the past. They demanded blood offerings in Greece. The old gods called for spring iwis to be thrown into the poisonous gorges at midnight, and in Rex Comasar Caucasia, the dupes and the parasites demanded offerings of human flesh and blood. But just as the light of civilization banished Grim Hecate from the hills of Greece, so too will the blaze of democracy and freedom burn away the foul remains of these false gods. These mountains, these valleys, these lands that have once been soaked in the blood and tears will be purified of national socialist stain. The monuments of Aaron ingenuity will be smashed. The palaces and the plantations will be burnt to cinders. The children, if they have survived, will be exiled to Germany. The paintings, statues, propaganda that mold molders in this land will be thrown into the mud like the refuse it is. The cities will be renamed by the people's will. The businesses will be expropriated and sold to Caucasian citizens. This bloated web of horror and suffering will be ripped down in twain. By the will of the free peoples of Russia, when we are finished, no one will know the same name as Josiah du Piermont. His legacy will be burned to ash, just like this bloated corpse. He will be wiped from history. There are some experiences which scar too deeply to permit healing. Repair the oil fields. Since it's discovered, the vast oil fields of Caucasia have served as economic bedrock of the region. During a campaign in the Nazi evacuation of the region, oil wells and refineries were destroyed in the thousands. In the economies of the Caucasian reconstruction zones are recovered in any meaningful capacity. As impaired, we rebuild the oil fields and begin the slow economic recovery of the next sacred nation. I do apologize for reading so fast, though. Yeah, we're doing alright, for now. Even though, like, all of this stuff, I'm gonna have to redo again. In all honesty, so. So even all this stuff, like, like we did in the like, last episode or whatever, it's all gonna be redone again off-screen. <clears throat> the Georgian and Azerbaijani. A small Georgian town of Matsimi was referred to by the Germans as Hessenstadt. There sat two old men on the older, po uh, older porch. They watched workers from all sorts of places rush about. There were Russians and Azeris, Georgians and Agdega. Even a Tartar had passed not too long ago. I haven't seen this many people on the streets since the Soviets were pulling out of here. Gyur exclaimed his old friend Yusuf. He was visiting from Maham Mahamar, just over the border in Azerbaijan. A strange seeing Russians so eager to help. Uh, I thought those communists were more eager in subjugating us all, like the Germans. It's odd seeing foreigners who care about people, Yusuf said. No, no, the Russians are not uh, communists. Well, not anymore. They're like Americans now, fighting for liberty, battling for democracy, for the liberation of all Russians, <clears throat> Georgi said. His powerful emphasis on the Russian president's catchphrase earned a new snicker from Yusuf. Ah, that's right, but we're not Russian, my friend. How do you know we can trust these people? What if they're just softening us up just to smack us down again, Naziri said. I'm not so sure, my friend. I suppose we'll have to trust the Russians this time around after everything Germany put us through. Anything this Federation does will be a million times better than the thing the SS did to us, Gyuri said. In the distance, a young girl with freckled cheeks waved the Russian tricolor with a smile on her face. Yusuf sat back in his chair, thinking on his friend's words. It certainly can't be any worse. The rebel Caucasian cities. During a great advance into the lands of Rex Commissar Caucasian. Unfortunately, many cities such as Grozny, Savropol, and Grasnodar were heavily damaged with many homes of innocent Caucasians destroyed in the fighting. It's time to rebel these broken cities and give these battered and bruised people a safe place they can call home. And the future Caucasia. With the reconstruction efforts of the Federation slowly leading Caucasia on the road to recovery, it's time to decide what the future of the diverse Caucasus region will be like. The land is rich in resources, especially oil, but the Caucasian Reconstruction Zone, since coming under the administration of Caucasian Reconstruction Zone, have enjoyed freedom and a higher level of autonomy than under the Reich. What will the future be? But the Black Bear first. <clears throat> Can you believe we're coming back to the same darn oil fields, Yusuf said? Hussein simply shrugged. Uh, uh, my wife needs to eat, he said. I can't wait for the Federation anymore. Too bad reconstruction hasn't gone quicker, Yusuf said. Mohammed told me they have hired a couple guys to rebel the old grammar school. How many? Just three. Darn it. The, friend walked together, the friends walked together to the admin office of the oil fields. Gravel crunched underfoot, and machinery roared in the distance. The proud flagpole next to the office no longer flew the swastika, and the carved rocks Adler had been torn from its mount above the entryway, but the foundations and the gray stone walls lay unchanged since the day Hussein first built them at the gunpoint. The pair entered the office and thumped from 
the, thumped the dirt from the work boots. In the atrium of the building, a young Russian woman sat typing below a banner that read, Welcome new employees of the Phoenix Extractives. Hussein walked up to the desk and cleared his throat. Excuse me, miss. My name is Hussein Abbasov. My friend here and I are we're here to start our first shift. The old woman turned to the pair and smiled. Hello, name Ekaterina Popov. Abbasov, nice to meet. She has an employee card. Yusuf cursed. She doesn't speak uh, screwing uh, Abazajani, he, he said. Darn ogres at Phoenix said it's an illiterate. Hussein took a breath. Uh, Miss, I can't understand you. Do you speak Turkish? She shook her head no. Arabic? Again, no. He said, Speak to Deutsch? She smiled and nodded. Yeah, yeah. Ich heiße Ekaterina Popov. Womit kann ich Ihnen helfen? Welcome to Caucasia, where we speak four or five different languages and seeing if we can speak the same language to anyone else around us. Which makes perfect sense, so yeah. Um, here. Hold a rally, because you can. There you go. <clears throat> we got to think about Koban, we got to think about Muscovy, and then of course the Northern District, which has more people now, which is cool. Uh, can I still do this area or this area? What do we, can we integrate this area? I want to, it, it seems like we should be able to, especially since we integrate all these other places so quickly, but I guess not. Or does this one not have uh, people in healing? Oh. The mere words could not describe the unspeakable horrors that the Caucasian people had to endure during Nazi rule. The horrors of life under Bug the Burgundian system, under the iron grip of Josiah's Duval. Valdek and Piermont are unspeakable. Even after his rule ended, the damage has already been done, no matter how loose a grip of his successor was. An era of slavery and oppression for all the population had left them psychologically scarred. When the all Russian army stormed into the Caucasus, they were met with nothing but praise and celebration. After all the suffering and toil, hope has shined brightly above the people as they began the long journey of finding themselves again. From the cultural revival programs to simple food and water redistribution, the spirit and energy of the population are being revived. The brutalist Nazi architecture is being torn down, and their place stands memorials for all those who have been fallen during the decades long occupation. In each city, New apartment complexes are being built. Supermarkets are cropping up almost out of the ground. There are even talks of American food chains opening up in Sarvopol. The Russian flag flies proudly in the flagpoles of every admin building in the region, along with the respective flags of the native peoples. Although these lands are forever scarred by the actions of the Reich, the people have honored the sacrifices of the Russian people in their efforts to liberate them from tyranny. Across the land, young and old men and women all look towards the shines or shines or sh shores once more. Shines, huh? Looking to ever ever onwards towards a brighter future and the future Caucasia. With the reconstruction efforts of the Caucasian and the reconstruction zone nearly completion, debate over the future of Caucasia is already erupted in the Federal Assembly. Some support total independence, others outright annexation with many in the middle, proposing their own solutions to the question. The government seems to be a deadlock. Vasily Shukshin's web of alliances has reached as far, and its charisma will, tur will turn enough for the public to decide to secure his vision of Caucasia's future. What shall be done with the region? Integrated? I want to do that one so badly. Give Georgians and Azerbaijanis independence and grant the region total independence. Down in Europe. The European continent has changed in the last decade. The hermit state of Burgundy solidifies its control of northern France. With their plans for this world, and only God knows is unfortunate no to enough. Enough to know. My bad. Germany, although beaten back, is still a superpower that holds influence of both continental and global influence. To the east rose a new hope in the form of the Russian Federation. Hailing from the vast plains of Siberia, the Federation has reunited all of Russia and successfully liberated the peoples of Eastern Europe from servitude to their former masters. With the map of Eastern Europe redrawn, we can now step forth and move our attention eastwards to Europe. The people of Europe yearn for freedom, and the Federation will do everything in its power to ensure the continent is liberated from the rule of tyrants. So, obviously, we're, we're, I'm going to redo this again. That's really okay with me, you know. Um, so, that's fine. As long as we can do what we want to do here. Ah, the Caucasian Federation. I gave them total independence, so... Uh, oil crisis, the Caucasian experiment. Is that the wrong one to do? The client state. So, admin, administrative unknowns. Is this a bad, was that the wrong option? We still have these guys here too, but. I will do the fate of Viborg as well, but. Uh, I gave him total independence. Was I not supposed to do that? I thought I was supposed to do that. Down in Europe, huh? I like the election thing. It's, it's kind of fun. Here, hold the rally there. I don't know. That's 18 million people. Holy crap. That's a lot of people. <coughs> and we'll get Viborg back, too. The city of Viborg was on the one by the Soviet Union in 1940, when the Red Army troops triumphed over the Finnish troops. Although the city was eventually taken by Finland during the Great Patriotic War, many of our journals believe that the St. Petersburg, back in the hands of the Russian Federation, we should put some distance between uh, the Finland and the St. Petersburg and take what's right there ours. Um, so we did that one last episode too. Um, so we got all that stuff done, and now we can get that one done. Our next challenge. Oh, we'll read four more years. The beloved president of the Federation, Vasily Shukshin, responsible for single-handedly unshackling Russia from the chains of the Siloviki unifier of Russia and the liberator of Eastern Europe. Uh, 
uh, from the German Jack, but it secured and mandated to govern for the people once more. President Shukshin is not content to treat his second term as nothing more than a victory lap. A bold new agenda is laid out to take up to take the Federation's greatness to the new heights. Looking to the Russian economy to further strengthen its dominance over Eurasia and gazing up towards the stars to give Russia a space program of its own, and the Russian Federation retakes Vyborg. As expected, our forces have triumphed over the smaller Finnish nation once again. As a result of this great victory, Vyborg has finally returned to our glorious motherland. The people of St. Petersburg are on our rest easier, knowing they want to fear an attack from the north anytime soon. A victory for the motherland. Oh, do they become... Do they join us? No. No, they don't. Darn it. That'd be really cool. The new face of Europe. Ashukshin sat quietly in his chair, looking down at the redrawn map of Eastern Europe. What did they take? Did they take? How did they own? Oh, I'm gonna have to use something here to get this stuff back. Um, he rubbed his eyes. He had, he had, had he made the right decisions with the West, with the settlers? He looked at the office that surrounded him. He wasn't used to the Kremlin, to Moscow. It wasn't like Novosibirsk. It had the same atmosphere he grew accustomed to in the vast plains of his native Siberia. Shukshin reached for the bottle of vodka on his desk, but the bottle snatched by a concerned Pokrushkin. Thank you, Alexander, Shukshin muttered as he leaned back in his chair. Vasily, you look like hell. When was the last time you slept? The aviator asked as he set the bottle on top of a cabinet out of Shukshin's reach. I haven't had a good night of rest in weeks, Shukshin muttered as he stared at the map once more. Me too. Pokrushkin sighed, grabbing the map, rolling it up, and setting it aside. It does not do well for one to dwell on your decisions. You did well, my friend. Eastern Europe is free, and that's all that matters. I know you're the president, but as your friend, I'm ordering you to get some sleep. Because of you, the Federation is stronger than ever. I'm sure it can handle you resting for a few hours. Shukin was silent for a moment, smiling before standing up. All right, Alexander, I'll go. If an angry CEO comes knocking, and tell him I'm far away from here. Sick of car or something. The president joked as he walked out the door. Pokrushkin shook his head with a grin on his face. To hope a future. And I'm going to try to clean this up a little bit more, but we're looking okay. I thought giving them total independence would be good, but... I don't know. I guess we'll see at the beginning of the next episode, which we'll get to next. So, um, if you enjoyed the video, though, hey, consider leaving a fat collective security treaty organization like. And we got Romania. We got Romania here, too. Look at that. Cosm Dragalina. Compassionate gentleman. Cosm. Uh, I think of people, of course. Uh, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we continue to see what else is in store and for the TNO Brave New World Code Docker update with. And then being very special. Thanks for watching. Have a great Russian rest of your day.